Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 21, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the town famed as the birthplace of Jesus Christ, might be the most famous small town in the world. But what do most people know about it? The answer for me was not much. I visited Bethlehem in March, and I didn't know what to expect before I got there. I knew very little about the real church of the Nativity or what the town was like during the first century AD. Seeing the church in person and learning about the history of the town helped me connect the biblical history I learned growing up with what modern historians know about the place today. My guest today is Nicholas Blinko. Best known as a novelist and screenwriter, his latest book, Bethlehem, Biography of a Town, is a history of Bethlehem through the ages. We chat about what ancient Bethlehem was like, why it looks historically a lot like the town that's described in the Bible and how its most famous son affected the town's prosperity in the centuries after his birth. My guest today is Nicholas Blinko. He's the author of the New History Bethlehem Biography of a Town. Hi, Nicholas. Hiya. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I've just woken up, but I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much. So, Listeners who've been with us since the beginning will know that we did an episode about the West Bank separation wall. And in that episode, I talked about my travels to Bethlehem, but we didn't focus on the period that it is most famous for, which oh. is the, uh, it, it, you know, I personally think that everyone should go see the West Bank separation wall. But when people go, they tend to go see the Church of the Nativity. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that period. How did you get interested in Bethlehem as a academic project? As an academic project, I'm a novelist and um, I did a PhD in philosophy at university, which is when I met my wife. And shortly after I finished, I went to Bethlehem because I had to meet her parents. It's her hometown. (laughs) So as an academic project, I think it kind of crept up on me that I was writing about everything else under under the sun as a novelist and then as a screenwriter. I just felt I had to write a history of history of the town. Was this the first book you wrote that was a history and not a novel? Yes, aside from um, aside from my PhD thesis, which is absolutely unreadable, and no one has read it other than me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it took me took me thirty years after the PhD to learn how to write normal, factual English. Well, I think for some of our listeners are aspiring historians, so I think that that is actually great to hear. <laughs> that that's okay. something that you can figure out on, like as you're as you're trying to do it. Yeah, I had to figure it out on the job. I mean. I could do footnotes and I had an idea what historical evidence was, but I had to go into it and really, really learn, learn how to write history. So why don't we talk a little bit about the origins of Bethlehem, because it is a very, very old town. Yes, the, the villages around Bethlehem, which make up the kind of Bethlehem region, are very old. They were exporting olive oil to the Nile and the Nile Delta 4,000 years ago. Today it's a big highway, but what started as a, tra- a kind of a pack horse trail led from Bethlehem down through Hebron and in, into the Sinai Desert and, and, and to Cairo. So that Bethlehem is a very old region. It's on a very old road, which today is called the Hebron Road, and which goes north through Jerusalem. Um, and it's also on an, another very, very old trail that runs the other way. So the Hebron Road is north-south, and there's another road that runs east-west, which runs up from the Dead Sea, which is in the desert, and Bethlehem's right on the edge of the desert. So a trail that comes up through the desert, crosses through just underneath Bethlehem, just to the south of Bethlehem, and goes on to port cities like Jaffa and Gaza. And so Bethlehem is on this kind of crossroads of two very, very ancient trails, that's why there's so many little villages there 
but also because it's sat on a huge aquifer. So it's a crossroads on top of a water source with little hill villages that sell olive oil, but also eventually started catering for travellers. The aquifer began to be used as the water source for Jerusalem, so a water, so an aqueduct was built. Bethlehem became kind of the guardian place for this aqueduct, but also a market town for the people um, crossing through it, especially the people coming up through, through that Dead Sea Trail. So in your book, you talk about how Bethlehem actually appears in the Old Testament before it appears in the New Testament. And I grew up a Catholic. I'm not anymore, but I, I didn't realize that this was a town that was mentioned in the Old Testament. How does it appear in the Old Testament? And what are the connections between that and what happens in the New Testament? Okay, well, my big argument in, in the book is that Bethlehem isn't really as old as the Bible suggests, because the Bible is telling stories which purport to be from, nobody. nobody's really successfully dated them. But if you read a book by a biblical historian, they'll tell you that the events of the Old Testament are happening around, around 1000 BC, which is um, kind of the Bronze Age period into, into the uh, Iron Age period. Well, I'm saying that Bethlehem isn't that old. It's only really 200 years older than the birth of Christ. So those stories of the Old Testament don't reflect an ancient history. They reflect a history that's really just a few, say, a hundred years before Christ is born. And the reason that we should put the stories from the Old Testament with the stories of the New Testament is that they're describing a town that probably hadn't changed much in that kind of two, three hundred years around Christ's birth. Um, and the reason I can date that it's very easy to date Bethlehem is because of this aqueduct that I mentioned earlier. Around 200 BC or BCE, uh, an aqueduct was built because Jerusalem was getting so many pilgrims from Alexandria, especially from Alexandria, but also from all over the world, all over the Middle East, but especially from Alexandria, which was the biggest Jewish city, had the largest Jewish population. It had a huge non-Jewish population too, but it was the largest Jewish city in the world. And the Jews of Alexandria and from Persia and, and other places where Jews had settled were traveling once or twice a year to Jerusalem, which couldn't cope with the numbers. The water source was crumbling. And in fact, it was worse than that because the water source and the sewage supply intermingled below the temple. So they were, the amount of tourists and pilgrims were contaminating the water. And the amount of animal sacrifice for the pilgrims was adding to this contamination. So a new water source was built. The water source was found in the Bethlehem Hills. An aqueduct was built. And this is during Greek rule of Palestine. An aqueduct was built. And it kind of curves around all the little hills and takes 15 miles to go what would be six miles as the crow flies and, and brings fresh water from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. So... The Bethlehem town was built right on top of it, very close to the, to the main source, and some reservoirs were built, and these reservoirs still exist. They're called These days they're called the Pools of Solomon, which is possibly a Crusader-era name for them. And Bethlehem defended this. So we can date Bethlehem. We know that it's 200 years old. A 200, it was 200 years old around the time of the birth of Christ. 2,300 years old, I should say, now. <laughs> <laughs> and it was famous for shepherds and sheep because it was a market town and because the shepherds were coming up through this trail from the Dead Sea. And it was famous for water because it defended the water supply. So you look at the stories in the Old Testament and one that is that it's associated with King David. Well, King David in Jewish mythology is a nomadic grazier. These people drive drove huge herds of sheep, could be really quite wealthy, and were on the borderline between being merchants and warlords because they had to be tough to live in the desert and to beat off other raiders and to guard their flocks. And they built their wealth on, on wool, which was an incredibly profitable commodity, especially if it could be washed and cleaned. And the Dead Sea is full of chemicals which are great in preparing wool like Fuller's Earth, which is a chemical used in the cleaning of wool. So the Bethlehem region was great for nomadic graziers, but the nomadic graziers were a bit of a threat because although 
you know, you want to do deals with them. You also want to keep them at arm's length because they're tough guys. So Bethlehem emerges as a, as a little walled city on top of a water supply. King David's, or the, the legendary King David is a nomadic grazier. So we've got shepherds and Bethlehem associated there. And one of the big stories of David and Bethlehem, but it's really an appendix to the main David story, says that uh, David one day mentioned how sweet the water was in Bethlehem. And in this particular little story, we're led to believe that Bethlehem is in the hands of the Philistine. And King David has three heroes that, that say, well, if, if our leader likes the water, we'll go and raid Bethlehem, steal the water and bring it back to him. And so we get this this kind of memory, uh, a legendary story about the water of Bethlehem, which emphasizes that the water earlier belonged to the Jews and to Jerusalem and still and now belongs to them again. So it's a kind of retro engineering of a history story to talk about the water of Bethlehem. A market town is also a place of negotiation and people would go to a caravanserai, a kind of garden at the edge of the city, and do negotiations and deals. And in, in another story in the Old Testament, which is the story of Boaz and Ruth, we get Boaz sitting at the gates of the town to negotiate buying Ruth, who's a kind of, um, presented as a kind of, kind of like a sex slave type of figure, a, a widow who's been pledged to somebody else and Boaz has to buy her. So he sits at the gates and does that deal. And in the final story of Bethlehem, which really is about a sex slave, somebody travels to, travels to Bethlehem, a Levite travels to Bethlehem, buys a concubine um, in Bethlehem, so a non-Jewish person, and travels back. So Bethlehem's a trading place, and also we find a foreign, associated with foreign foreigners, i.e. non-Jews, uh, like the concubine, and it's important for water and shepherds. So then, so that's a very long, uh, long discussion of the Old Testament. We, but we get to the New Testament, and it, immediately we find the mention of shepherds in the Nativity story, and of the Magi. Um, and again, the shepherds are there to emphasise that they're, 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 the shepherds and Magi are there to for symbolic reasons, I guess. But they're also kind of reality because they're two people who would pass through the town, uh, the shepherds to trade sheep. And the Magi are representatives of a different uh, tribe called the Nabataeans, who traded gold, frankincense and myrrh and other spices and valuables. So we, so we get a picture of Bethlehem as a market town. Sorry, that was such a long answer. No, it was wonderful. So I have a question. The Nabataeans, so we did an episode on Petra and right. their amazing capital. And I would really like the Saudi Arabian government to let me come and see some of their other places in Saudi Arabia. But I believe Jeddah is going to get opened up a bit. I am ho- I'm really hoping because I interviewed uh, Jane Taylor about Petra and she was telling me about this place in Saudi Arabia, but obviously as a woman, like you have to have like a husband or a father or a brother who takes you. And, um, I don't, none of those people are going to want to take me to Saudi Arabia or, or have passports. But, um, as far as the Nabataeans go, I don't think I realized until I was reading through your book that the Nabataeans were in Bethlehem. Of course they were. It makes, it's not a very big region. No. But what was the Nabataean influence in Bethlehem? Okay, the, the, the Nabataeans are famous for two things. One, the, the spice route, and the other thing is water engineering projects. And they both go together because uh, the Nabataeans, in a sense, have the longest, thinnest empire ever because it's only the width of a pack horse trail or a camel trail. Um, but it extends all the way into Ethiopia, into Arabia, up through the Arabian deserts and you know, the Petra region, the Dead Sea region, and onto the coast and to Naples. And there's been Nabataean temples found in Naples. I mean, the only source of gold in Roman times really was Ethiopia. They also needed the spices that came fr- from, from Ethiopia, from Yemen and further afield, like cinnamon and nutmeg and obviously frankincense, myrrh, balm. 
Oh, the, these are all luxury products and quite necessary products for flavoring that the Nabataeans completely controlled. And because they ultimately controlled the Dead Sea area, they also controlled the chemicals of the Dead Sea. And I mentioned some of those that are important for, sh for sh the, sh the wool industry, like Fuller's Earth. But there's other ones like potash, which is very important as a fertilizer, but then became both. It's important for making glass because it's and soap because in both cases, both in glass and soap manufacture, it's the thing that makes the other chemicals run. So it makes the sap, the silica run to make glass, and it makes it makes this well whatever soap's made of the soapy stuff. <laughs> rather, <laughs> so the Nabataeans started to, started to control. The Dead Sea, oh, it's also got bitumen in it, which was important for waterproofing. It waterproofed the bottoms of boats, and it waterproofed the roofs of houses. And the Nabataeans were controlling two huge industries, but they were controlling them in incredibly inhospitable regions. And this is why uh, they became great water engineers. And uh, There's um, an Israeli archaeologist whose names just escaped me, unfortunately, believes that the word Nabataean means water, kind of water engineer or something, if that's, if that's a word. Uh, water finder, I think he argued it means, which is really possible. One of the things that the Nabataeans discovered, thanks to their chemical background, was how to create waterproof plaster barriers at very low temperatures. The other, only other people who had a, a waterproof uh, cement barrier head with the Romans and the Greeks, which their process requires heavy kilns, but um, heavy duty kilns, I should say. But the Nabataeans method, according to, to the archaeologists who've worked on this, didn't require such high temperatures because they found the kind of silica in the desert, which made creating this kind of plaster cement much easier. And you can still you can still see traces of this Nabataean barrier, and it would be used in be used in aqueducts. It would be used in cisterns, and the Nabataeans uh, dug holes across the desert, covered them in plaster, turned them into cisterns, and built aqueducts that stretched many many hundreds of miles to gather rainwater because there's a bit of rain in the desert, and draw this rainwater into cisterns, which they hid and became their water sources as they travelled through the desert, so they never ran out of water. So yeah. That's amazing. I, when I was in Wadi Rum, my guide showed me a cistern and he said it was very old and it's probably not that old, but it's probably very, it was probably similarly constructed to the way, because it, it was like hundreds of years old, not thousands of years old, but I imagine the technology was pretty similar. Yes, absolutely. Um, because the technology worked, it didn't change for an incredibly long while. And the Nabataeans were really had a kind of empire, or at least a trading empire, from around 600 BCE to around 400 AD or CE. So let's talk about the historical Jesus and his birth in Bethlehem, because that's one of the things that I, I have a hard time when I go to places like the Church of the Nativity or... Um, places like the baptism site, wrapping my head around the idea that there's enough evidence that these places are real, like that these are the real spots. But um, I was talking to Gary Arndt on an episode about the UNESCO World Heritage List, and he was saying that when he was in, uh, when he was at the baptism site, you know, that he was talking to the guy that was showing him, you know, all of the evidence that they have that goes back to like the 200s. So mm. what do we know about Bethlehem? as it pertains to being the birth site of Jesus that's rooted in like, it's real, that's contemporary. What's, you know, in the hundred, 200 years that follow. Yeah. Well, as the guy told, told your friend, the, in, insofar as there's any very old evidence, it, it would be 200 CE. So 200 years after the birth of Christ, but we also have the gospels and these, seem to have been written about, well, again, 100 to 200 years after the birth of Christ. But they're building on a tradition that already exists. And it seems that pilgrims were going to Bethlehem kind of within living memory of the, of the ministry of Christ and the death of Christ. 
So you've got a kind of folk memory there, and certainly a tradition grew up reasonably quickly after the death of Christ that Bethlehem really was his birth site. And so insofar as anything exists that's 200 years uh, or 300 years after the birth of Christ, th this is building on, on an existing tradition of pilgrimage that was already several hundred years old. And I think that's kind of strong evidence. It's certainly, it's certainly strong evidence that people believed it within memory of Christ, which is really is something. Otherwise, we've got to kind of speculatively reconstruct evidence. And, and the evidence we would have is like, well, why here? And as I was saying earlier, Bethlehem grew up as a market town. And the people who used the market were quite fearsome and dangerous. So Bethlehem had both had to welcome them, but keep them at arm's length. And the way it did that was it had a caravanserai or an inn, which would just be at the gates of the town. And this inn would be a campsite, basically. It would be a garden. And, you know, we see that Christ's last night on earth is in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, which is a similar caravanserai of Jerusalem. These campsites, you know, you'd be able to put out your bedroll underneath a tree, grab street food, find somewhere to water your animals. Uh, but it would be at the borders of the town, so you weren't really being allowed through the gates into the city. You were just being kept at arm's length. And it's definitely the site of Christ's nativity, which now is inside a building, was definitely a garden when it, when it first became a pilgrimage site. So it is the site of the caravanserai of Bethlehem. And it's exactly where it's an inn where a traveller would stay if they were visiting the town, a nomadic traveller. Uh, and it's a place where the animals would be fed and watered. And a very early manger, which was mentioned by a pilg an English pilgrim, St. Arkulf, in around 600 AD, seems to be this, a similar thing that was shown to St. Helena when she was shown the site of the nativity. And it was said that, oh, and this is the manger where Christ was born. Well, it's described as being ceramic, so which means it's waterproof. So it's more likely to be a water trough than a manger, unless they were interchangeable at the time. But again, this shows that, you know, uh, there was already a tradition growing up that where animals drank and were fed is the place where Christ was born. And it's a garden. It's a little garden on the edge of town. So we have that in that that part of the story is is plausible. And then we have the shepherds there. Well, again, as I was saying that the shepherds were kind of dangerous people but they were and and outsiders um so we, we have those in the inn with christ which is all i mean it's not it's not proof that christ was born there but it's a very vivid picture of a town at the time that christ uh, the birth of christ is is dated to we also have the the magi um and the nabataeans and both these people the shepherds and the Nabataeans are interesting for the time because the shepherds would have been from another proto-Arab tribe called the Idumeans, And King Herod was related to both of these tribes. He was related to the Nabataeans on his mother's side and to the Idumeans on his father's side. So the Bible is, is telling us in a kind of symbolic way that King Herod's closest relatives, even King Herod's closest relatives, don't like King Herod that much. And would prefer would prefer Christ to be their king. So it's got a symbolic meaning, but it also captures a city around one eight uh, the first century, where these travellers would be meeting in an inn on the edge of Bethlehem. And I think that's a vivid vivid picture of Christ. Yeah, it's one of those things where I've I've listened to a lot of like there's a really great podcast that I can't remember the name of it that is like a series of college lectures from I want to say the University of Toronto about like the historical evidence for Jesus and I, and I took a Roman history class where we did you know this is where he's mentioned in I want to say Appian this is where he's mentioned in somewhere else but I haven't I haven't taken any classes that were the physical evidence so that's really I think that's really interesting. It's not really mentioned very often. I think there's Josephus mentions him, but that's because so long after his death and his ministry, he, uh, the Christians were becoming politically significant. 
that there's nothing really from from the time of his ministry that that mentions him at all. But you know, we're, we're confident that, he, that they refer to a real character because it's all happening within living memory. You just couldn't fake it. <laughs> Actually, and that's who I was thinking of which was Josephus and not Appian, but it's been 12, 14 <laughs> years since I took that course. So, But I just, I just find all of this stuff really interesting. And then being there in April and seeing it all and hearing mm-hmm. just the – it's it's hard to understand how much work and rigor goes into figuring these things out. And But it's so interesting, like – because, and, and part of why I find it so interesting is these places are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It's not like they're just church sites where the church is the authority. Like there are outside authorities that have looked at all of the evidence and said, yeah, this is where we know enough to say that this is as close as we're going to get to what we what is knowable about this. Yeah. The argument against Christ being born in Bethlehem would really be that it feels too symbolic because there's a, a prophecy in the Old Testament saying that the new Messiah will be born of King David's line. He's, they're linking David and Christ together by putting Christ, Christ's birth in Bethlehem. And the two gospel accounts aren't quite in agreement with each other. In, in one of the gospels, Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem because it's not the city they live in. It's a city where one or the other of their ancestors comes from, which pins them, just links them to King David. And in the other gospel, they actually do live in the town. So the gospels aren't in agreement, and it all feels a little, maybe a little bit too convenient that Christ is being linked to the city where David is said to have been born. But as I as I pointed out, David wasn't really, even in, in the... Old Testament accounts, David isn't really born in Bethlehem. He's, been, he's born in the deserts around Bethlehem. He's even a stranger to Bethlehem. He's more of the Bethlehem region as a, as a, a desert, nom- a nomadic desert grazier. So, I mean, I don't know if Christ was born there, but th- there's, there's plenty of evidence that people writing the Gospels know Bethlehem and they're painting a very plausible picture. I'm saying Christ must have been born somewhere and everyone agrees he was born in Bethlehem. Well, I think I think for me, what's surprising is that there's more evidence than a skeptic like me going into it would yes. would ima- would possibly imagine. And that when you go, like, part of me thinks like, oh, the cynical side of me thinks, oh, this is a tourist destination to get people all over the world to come and spend money at these sites. And some of them are in Israel and some of them are in Jordan. But, you know, like there's a lot of money to be made. But when you get there, you realize, no, these are actually very serious, significant historical sites with lots of academic rigor behind them. And that is it's just the opposite of what I expected. And I was very I don't know, it restored my faith in humanity a little bit that it wasn't like that. You know what I mean? Well, it's a wonderful place to visit for, from a historical perspective because the church itself was built by St. Helena around the turn of the 4th century. And so it's, uh, and a bit of that church still exists, the, the mosaic floor, for instance. So that, that makes it the oldest working Roman temple still in existence. I mean, people are, are worshipping there as they worshipped in Roman times in a Roman temple. And it looks like a Roman temple. St. Helena's first church was destroyed during a revolt by the Samaritans, who are a Jewish sect who don't recognize David in Jerusalem. And that story of Jerusalem being uh, the capital city of Judaism, they're kind of renegades who believe that the Nablus is is the kind of capital of the Jewish faith. So but and they were they were kind of they were the majority of, of people living in Palestine in the sixth century mounted a rebellion against Rome and in the course of that rebellion destroyed St. Helena's church, but it was immediately rebuilt. And so again, a Roman temple. And it looks, as I said, it looks like a Roman temple. It's got that little triangular roofy thing. It's got the pillars. You, you walk through the, the large doors of the time have been closed down to stop horses, Persian horsemen charging in, which happened during a different invasion. So they've been, the, the, Doors have been made smaller, but you walk through these little doors into a vestibule and then into um, into a temple that's got columns either side, and it's it, it's from the time of Ju- the Emperor Justinian. It's 
6th century. And you walk along this, you get to a kind of rotunda at the end. It's temple-like structure, ends in a a round structure. And this is on the site of St. Helena's original rotunda. And what she did, and this is really fascinating to me. Oh, I love St. Helena. She was my confirmation saint. So tell as many stories about her as you want, because I find her fascinating. Well, you probably know that she was a barmaid in around the Smyrna, uh, Smyrna, Izmir region, and what's now Turkey was then Anatolia. She met a Roman warrior, uh, Constantius, I think his name was, who was from what's now Serbia. They fell in love, got married, had a son, Constantine. But St. Helena's husband was so ambitious that he divorced her, made a more a better political match, and went on to become one of the one of the leaders of the empire and the, an emperor of the western half of the empire. But their son, Constantine, you know, became the emperor Constantine, and Saint Helena, who had um, become a, a Christian, was then the most powerful woman in the empire at quite an old age. And she made this legendary pilgrimage, where she travels through the down through Anatolia and through. The, all the Middle East, kind of spending money, rebuilding the empire and building churches as she goes to stamp that mark that the empire is now a Christian empire and she's the first lady of the Christian empire. When she gets to Bethlehem, she's shown the site uh, and she builds the church, but the church she builds is really, really unusual. And it's so unusual that I've argued it, it shows a kind of personal touch. She wasn't just taking a generic design for churches that something very unusual was happening. And the reason it's so unusual is that, as I said, Christ was born in a garden. Well, in Bethlehem, this garden was, would have been surrounded by caves. And the caves are where the, the people running the caravanserai would prepare food, uh, where people could shelter from the rain if it was bad weather. Um, and one of these little caves is the one that was identified as being the site of Christ's birth. Well, what she did was open up the roof of the cave so that you could look down into it built a rotunda around it with a gallery in the rotunda. So you could, as you were praying and or singing, you could look down into the earth, into the cave where Christ was born. Well, I think from a Freudian perspective, it's quite symbolic. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm reading too much into it, but you know, you, you go into a church and then look into a hole in the ground where, where a child emerged. That design became quite influential. It became influential with other wealthy Christian women who were coming from Rome. So a woman called St. Echalia built another church just outside of Bethlehem, which is called um, the Seat of Mary. Uh, Not much of it exists anymore, but you can still see part of it. And this is supposed to be the point where a pregnant Mary sat down as she rested on her way from Jerusalem into Bethlehem. And she built a church with exactly the same design, a rotunda that looks down onto a rock. And on the rock, there's supposed to be the marks of two buttocks. So you were looking down <laughs> at, at the imprint of St. Saint, Saint Mary's bum. And a third Roman woman built a similar, similar church in Jerusalem. I'm not quite sure what that commemorated, but I think it was the Annunciation. So again, you were looking at a place where Mary was lying down sleeping and the Archangel Gabriel came and addressed her, and again, they they made a rotunda, and you look down onto the rock where she was resting her. Uh, So three women used exactly the same design, which isn't used anywhere else, and built churches. Although I say it wasn't used anywhere else, it is used in one other building, and that's the Dome of the Rock, which is the mosque in Jerusalem. That's much, much grander. It's one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. But again, it's a large ornamental rotunda. You go inside it, and you look down into a cave, below the earth and look at a big rock and that big rock is supposed to be where Abraham sacrificed Isaac or was about to sacrifice Isaac and was his hand was stopped by the voice of God so very very unusual design of a church that commemorates a specific event of the Holy Land was kind of invented either by St. Helena or by St. Helena's architects and became well, it became a mark of the Jerusalem Bethlehem area, but also a mark of female church builders. And then it was kind of borrowed to commemorate a male event. <laughs> Have you been inside the Dome of the Rock? Yes. So I, when I went, I couldn't go because I was just there as a tourist and I'm not, I, I was able to go into oh. the complex, but not into the building. 
Oh, right. It's been a while since I went, so I can't tell you oh. what the exact rules are, but there'll definitely be a time of day or a time of the week when you can go, I'm sure. I think they changed the rules is what I think, but I don't remember off the top of my head. But um, yeah, I, I when I was there, I got to walk all around it. And I was actually just telling a friend yesterday, the guy that runs the website Black and Abroad, which is a really cool website. Um, I was telling him, don't miss it because it's amazing. But like pay attention to the rules because they're very strict. Don't have uh, a, don't have a laptop in your backpack because they'll make you leave it behind. And then you'll be stressed out running across Jerusalem to try to get it back. When you're done with your visit, like it's a very, but like it is one of the coolest things that you can do when you're there. But just like look up the rules because they change and follow. <laughs> There's a fountain in that courtyard, that vast courtyard that has the Al Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock Mosque. A fountain built by a Christian architect, and his name is something like Al Nazarene. Nazarene's an early word for Christian, and he's the guy who refurbished the original aqueduct and rebuilt Solomon's pools. And this fountain is kind of the other end of the aqueduct where bringing water to what by that point in, um, in the post-Crusader periods, I think I'm right in saying the 14th century, it was already, you know, it was, it was a Muslim city by that point. But again, you've got that memory of the water supply and the fountain he built. You see copies of that in quite a lot of English towns. It's, I think Victorian architects took a fancy to it, borrowed the design, and you see it as a, as the water fountain in quite a lot of English cities. That's amazing. Um, so I just looked up the rules real quick. So they closed the Dome of the Rock to actually going inside it in 2000 after the outbreak of the Second Intifada, which makes sense. And it's one of my biggest reasons why I think people should just, if there's a place people want to visit, they should figure out how to go there now because you never know what's going to happen. And like you may not be able to go there tomorrow, so you should go. Uh, right. Oh, that that is a shame. And yes, um, I haven't I hadn't been back in seventeen years. So I, w- I went with Layla, and I remember sh- she was wearing shorts, so she had to put a skirt on that was supplied a, a nylon skirt. I have been given so many strange things to wear, but mosque that's usually pretty straightforward. It's just like how um, intense it has to be around my face, like can I have a tiny bit of hair out or like, do I really have to like, but there are some Orthodox churches where like there was this Orthodox church in Moldova where they literally gave me a kerchief and like a skirt to wear over my jeans. I I looked like a 19th century peasant. It was crazy. So yeah, I always try when I go to places of worship, I always dress modest, but you just never know what they're going to give you to wear. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit about the visiting the Church of the Nativity now, because I was not prepared for how impressive and how awestruck I was going to be when I got there. <laughs> well, like there was like our Armenians were chanting and, and and women around me were crying. And as someone who grew up Catholic, but is now an atheist, sorry, mom, um, I respect all the history but i didn't expect other people's emotions and the 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 whole site to get to me and it really did well i i can't say i'm a believer either but i absolutely love the church and love going there so yeah i'll if i'm in bethlehem i'll i'll go almost every other day and i'm and i'm good at choosing times when there aren't many tourists around and also because i know the complex very well I can always sneak away from the tourists. You've got to remember, for, for 10 years, from 2002 to about 2012, there just weren't any tourists. Everyone was living off their savings. It was a very grim time. And so the church was quiet. You could go wherever you wanted. Now, now it's tourism, thank God, has picked up a bit. And Bethlehem has money coming back into it. But I still, I still go every day. So let me tell you, I'll try and paint a picture of the church. Well, the church is is actually a complex it's a kind of campus of monasteries and it occupies the top of a hill uh, overlooking the desert which is at the foot of a so it's a round hill but it's at the foot of a ridge of hill so if you imagine it an, an exclamation mark so you've got the ridge as the body of the the line of the exclamation mark and the period at the foot of the exclamation mark. That's where the church nativity is. 
but it, it used to be the entire city. So what's happened is the city has been pushed off the hill and up the ridge. And so the old city of Bethlehem is, is now on the ridge. And the original city of Bethlehem is completely enclosed within the campus of the Church of Nativity and the monasteries around it. The first building would be in St. Helen. The first religious building would have been St. Helena's original church. And then St. Paula came along and built more monasteries and other Christians came. And eventually so much of the land was built up with churches and monasteries and bought up that this kind of forced the actual city off. So it's a fair size, the church and the nativity. I mean, it's still only village size, but it's a fair size village. It's got lots and lots of different buildings. And as you said, there's Armenians there. The Armenians came with the Crusaders. They were part of the Crusaders' force. Uh, we think of the Crusaders as being Western Europeans, but they were actually a multinational force. They picked up people as they went. And the Sicilian Normans, who were a Viking race, had, had worked as um, kind of soldiers of fortune for the Armenians. So that's the connection with the Crusaders and the Armenians. The Armenians came and helped conquer the area. And as a reward, were given part of the church and nativity. So there's an Armenian monastery. The Latin Catholics there, Franciscans, and they got part of the monastery post the Crusades by using soft power, which is basically money. When it was being run from Cairo, the Franciscans got permission to, to be in the church and nativity. So you've got the Fr Franciscans who run the Latin part, Armenians run the Armenian part, and the Orthodox run the Orthodox part, which is the biggest part. The Orthodox have changed over the years because, again, the Orthodox Church is a global church and who were, whoever was most in favour with whoever ruled the Holy Land got control of the church. And it's now run by the Greek Orthodox, which sets up a really big schism with the Arab Orthodox because uh, Palestine is an Arab town. People speak Arabic and most Christians are Arab Orthodox. And they're kind of excluded from their own church by the Greek Orthodox. So there's a kind of imperialism within Christianity. My wife is actually a Latin Christian, but most Palestinian Christians are, are Orthodox Christians. So, yeah, the church is divided up between these, these different monasteries. Um, there's two basic churches, the Church of the Nativity, which is Orthodox, with a bit of Armenians at the back, and St. Catherine's, which is a newer church, uh, which is Latin. There's monasteries around it. There's gardens. There's cisterns in the gardens to provide water to all the monks. There's libraries. I mean, it's a really fascinating ramshackle place, but each little building and each little chapel is, I, I find, really, really powerful. And there's caves underneath the church, and I particularly like these. There's a cave that's associated with St. Jerome, who is a, a Christian translator and writer who St. Paula brought with her to Bethlehem. And it's in Bethlehem that St. Jerome translated what was then the Greek Bible. And he used some non-Greek Aramaic part uh, texts to create the first Latin book. So he created the Latin Bible, which became the basis of the translation of the English Bible. And a lot of the phrases that we really know from the English language Bible are from St. Jerome's Latin Bible. A great, great, not an admirable human being, it has to be said. He was kind of a petty guy. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but a great, great poet. So all, the, po the poetry that we know of the Bible all comes from St. Jerome actually working in the monastery in Bethlehem. And there's a little chapel be below the church, which is said to be his study. I mean, it wasn't. They've just designated a cave as being his study. In actual fact, he worked in an upstairs room with a beautiful view of the desert. Uh, St. Paul, real St. Paul's monastery was basically a publishing house that, um, with lots and lots of copyists who copied St. Jerome's books and texts and and sold them, sent them around the world to subscribers. It was a kind of vertic vertically integrating publishing industry. <laughs> well, I'm sure the modern publishing industry wishes that they had some of their magic because uh, the Bible sold a lot of copies. Yes, and it's St. Jerome's copy. It was called the Vulgate, which sounds terrible. Oh, okay. I know. Yeah. It just means the common version. So St. Jerome is the author of the Vulgate and the Vulgate is the basis of like the King James, which is the one used by Anglicans. 
So if somebody were to go there today, what would you suggest? I was there on a tour. A lot of people will be there on a tour and they're not going to have the time to wander around as much as they might want. Okay. What are the things that they absolutely should not miss if they're not really in control of their own schedule? I would say straight off, it's a shame to go on a tour because the tour buses are arranged between the Palestinian owners of gift shops and the Israeli owners of the tour buses. And the Israeli owners of the tour buses take money off the gift shop owners. So they're basically the gift shop owners are buying tourists or buying tourists time in order to take them into their gift shops to sell them gifts. And this is a huge source of money for Bethlehem and important. But it does mean that your journey to Bethlehem feels a bit icky. You're guided around by Israelis who don't know the town that well. And you, at some point during your stay, you'll probably be taken to a very large gift shop and um, given the hard sell. So it's better if you can go on your own. Oh, you know what? So I went on a tour, but I did not go on a tour like that. And the the person that did my tour is the person that I interviewed because he's like a local Palestinian who does his own day tours. And his name, his co- tour company is called Tamar Tours. So um, uh, if you need a tour company because you're coming from Jerusalem and you just feel like it's too overwhelming for you to try to do it by yourself, his company... I, I It wasn't a sponsored trip I paid for that day. And I would recommend it because not only did he do a really good job, he didn't do that. And also we've stayed in touch for like the last six months and he is just like a cool person. (laughs) The Bible College too in Bethlehem organizes tours and at the Holy Land Trust, they organize tours. So you you can find tour guides inside Bethlehem and that's probably a better thing to do. So what should you definitely do? Well, obviously you should go to the church and you should walk Uh, Star Street, which is the original pilgrimage trail, which takes you through the old city of Bethlehem and the Souk into Manger Square and into the church. At the back of the church, there's a water fountain. It's not very impressive, but it's the Ottoman water fountain. And it's interesting to see to see the water supply, really. And you should also go to see Solomon's Pools, which are these vast Roman reservoirs which are just two miles south of Bethlehem. Uh, So you'll see where the water was gathered, taken by aqueduct into Bethlehem, underneath the hill where the church is, and onto Jerusalem. So that's a a very cool thing to see, these Roman ruins. If you've got a little bit more time, there's there's a very grand hotel called the Jasser Palace, which is on Hebron Road. And opposite the Jasser Palace, there's a new museum, and that's got sections of the the Roman aqueduct. at one point, there were two aqueducts, the old, old, old Greek aqueduct and a Roman aqueduct. And this has um, sections of the Roman aqueduct inside it. So that's a very cool thing to see. And you could also go in the Jasa Palace, which is the most beautiful Ottoman mansion and is now um, a five star hotel. Get something to eat and go, go, go visit the museum. So I'd, I'd say look at the water su- supply, whether that's the Solomon's Pools these Roman reservoirs, look at the Church of the Nativity. I would say go to Mount Herodian. That's in, that's in now in the, on, it's occupied land in the desert and it's under the control of the Israeli Antiquity Authority. And they tell a particular story which really has no evid- much evidence. They focus on a particular event, which is the Bar Koba revolt. And that it's debatable how much Mount Herodian actually had to do with the Bar Koba revolt. But it's, it's a fortress that was built by King Herod on the site of an older kind of customs post stroke fortress that stands at the foot of the at the head rather of the wadi, which leads up from the Dead Sea. So that's a really interesting thing. It's a, it's a kind of a conical mountain with a fortress on top, which again controlled the access from the desert into Bethlehem. And I think that's a, a really fantastic, uh, fantastic thing to see. What is christmas like in bethlehem crazy the christmas of latin catholics episcopalians protestants that's the night of the 24th into the 25th it's the main christmas for half the pilgrims and that's held in saint catherine's and it's really crazy you get everyone fills the square tries to get tickets to go into the church we have midnight mass 
the president arrives with the, the senior Muslim cleric and the senior Christian cleric from Jerusalem. They all come down to Bethlehem and they're there at the midnight mass. Yasser Arafat came while he was alive and now it's Mahmoud Abbas is the president of Palestine. And so he comes and we celebrate mass. A lot of people dressed up as Father Christmas. There's pipe bands because you've got to remember Bethlehem was under the control of the British for 30 years and they introduced the Cub Scout movement and bagpipes. And these still exist. The Cub Scouts of Bethlehem play bagpipes. So at Christmas, you'll hear uh, Palestinian Christians playing Scotland the Brave and marching around the square. Oh, wow. it's It's a really crazy night, a huge tree in the square. Then on January the 6th, which is Orthodox Christmas, you've got a huge amount of new pilgrims, and they're from the, often from the Ukraine and from Russia. It's a different kind of service, but there's another midnight mass that's held in the ancient church of the nativity in, in this Roman temple I'm talking about. And that's incredibly moving because the Orthodox have a, an entirely sung service. It's quite different to um, the Western Christian tradition of, a spoken service where we, you know, the the priest asks us questions and as a congregation we reply. In the Orthodox one, it's just a priest kind of singing and chanting all the time. So that's beautiful. And finally, on the 21st of January, there's the Armenian Christmas. And the president of Palestine comes for the third time. The senior cleric Muslim cleric comes for the third time and they celebrate Armenian Christmas. So there's, there's actually three Christmases over Christmas, over a, a four week period in Bethlehem. That's amazing. So if anyone needs to know where to go next year for Christmas, that sounds like a pretty good place to spend your one of your three, whichever one is your <laughs> Christmas. Whichever suits you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the book and where people can find it? Okay, well, it's called Bethlehem, a biography of a town. It's published in both America and England. I think the English one is the one that's being exported to Australia. So really, wherever you are, you'll be able to buy it. It's uh, Nation Books in America, uh, Constable Books in the UK. It's, you know, available from all good bookshops and there's an e-book and everything else. (laughs) And it's, a, it's available on Amazon right now. So people should yes, yeah, check absolutely. it out, like ASAP. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it and telling us about this amazing, cool history of this place everyone knows, but nobody knows well enough. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. It's been a real pleasure. All, uh, happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. thank you again to Nicholas for coming on the show. This is the second episode of the show to focus on Palestine, and it's amazing how much fascinating history there is to cover in just this one corner of the world. If you want to learn more about the recent history of Bethlehem and Palestine, check out episode four, the West Bank Separation Wall. And if you want to learn more about the Nabataean culture, check out episode six, which was the episode about Petra. And then, of course, to learn more about the history of Bethlehem, pick up Nicholas's book, Bethlehem Biography of a Town. It's really, really good. Some housekeeping. If you find that the podcasts that you listen to are publishing a little less frequently during the holidays, I have two interviews on other wonderful podcasts that I recorded recently that you should check out. Um, Links to both of these episodes will be in the show notes. The first episode was for a podcast called The Wonders of the World Podcast. Drew's show is like this one in that he covers the history of ancient and important places. I joined him for an episode about Petra. If you like the Petra episode that I recorded with Jane or want to learn more about the Nabataeans, definitely check out this show. Drew tells the story of Petra, and then in between he spliced our conversation, which was him interviewing me about what it's like to travel in Petra and Jordan today. So he covers all the great history, and I tell you about the time that I thought I was being kidnapped and why I should have worn very different shoes. So it was really fun to record that episode. You should definitely check it out. And then the second podcast interview that I did was for, was completely different, not history-related at all. There is a really awesome podcast called These Are Their Stories, a Law & Order podcast. And what they do is Kevin and Rebecca 
for that show, every week they watch an episode of Law and Order and then they record themselves and a guest breaking down the episode and it's super fun. For our episode, we picked out an episode of Law and Order SVU and just dissected it and it's really fun. If you like Law and Order or if you like to hate watch Law and Order, this is definitely a show that you'll like. And um, that one was crazy fun to do. So links to both of these episodes will be in the show notes. Definitely check them out, especially if you need more things to listen to this time of year. This is the last episode of 2017. Um, Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate the people that I see you guys downloading the show every week. I can tell that you guys are listening to it. I really appreciate it. I'd love any notes or feedback that you guys want to send my way. You can email me at stephanie at historyfangirl.com. I hope you and your families have happy holidays wherever you guys are. And um, thank you so much for listening.